Tofacitinib is a competitor of ATP binding site of the Janus kinases. We have the structure of ATP, which has an adenine, it has a ribose, which is a sugar, and then it has the three phosphate groups, which is critical for the function of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. What ATP does is donate one of the phosphorus molecules that it has at the very end to produce energy. And of course, we all know that phosphorus is a highly energy containing element in the table of elements. So when we light a match, we see the fire. If we fall down, if we hit ourselves, if we have a cold, we also can feel the heat in our body. And that's produced by mainly ATP donating a phosphorus to provide the necessary energy for enzymes to start working and produce healing, for instance. But this is also important for life and even to maintain our body temperature. So ATP is actually mentioned as the currency of life. It is highly preserved in all living cells. And it's the way that the living organisms can easily obtain energy to produce the many different chemical reactions that we need in life. So going back to tofacitinib, what tofacitinib is as a competitor uh, inhibitor of the ATP binding site, it actually inhibits ATP from binding. So it has to have a structure that somehow mimics. So let's look at the adenine moiety. What we have there, adenine is a nucleic acid derivative of the purine series. And what tofacitinib uses is the pyrolopyrimidine series of a very similar chemical structure. When we move to the ribose, tofacitinib does not have a sugar. It uses the piperidine series, which was the most optimal series to produce this particular drug. I encourage you all to look at the references that I have, especially from Mark Flanagan, on how this discovery happened in a span of over three years and many, many nights in the lab working on finding which would be the best structure. And finally, ATP has, of course, the three phosphate groups. That's what makes ATP the currency of life. And of course, where are the phosphates in tofacitinib? They're not, because it's an inhibitor. It's a competitor inhibitor of ATP. So what is the challenge when you want to inhibit only one kinase or a small group of kinases? There's over 500 kinases in the human kinome. And a kinase is basically uh, an enzyme that uses ATP to produce energy. And a depiction of these kinases is, uh, is shown on this slide, but I encourage you to look at the reference where I got it because it's a dynamic interactive image. And you can actually look at all of the different families of the kinases and this very uh, good source that I found on protein kinases. So, what happens is all of these kinases use ATP. And by using ATP, which I mentioned, is actually found in all living cells. So I'm just showing the human kinome, but ATP is highly conserved. And so they have to have similar places where they accept the ATP in the structure of all of these kinases. And again, this is the structure of ATP. So when you try to inhibit a kinase, the competitive inhibition is the most common approach. And there are several, many, many examples in our drug armamentarium of using inhibition of kinases by using drugs that can inhibit ATP by their structure. Uh, many of them are used in oncology and have been used in oncology for a long time. When the discovery of the tofacitinib happened and the development of this drug happened, 
uh, the idea was to basically focus on a small group of kinases or basically originally just the JAK3 kinase. How do you inhibit only one kinase when ATP is highly conserved and we have a structure that can actually, that's very similar from ATP so that it can compete with the binding site? But how can you compete only with the binding site of one kinase when all of these are highly conserved? Just in case you missed it, that's where the Janus kinase family sits. They are very close together and the closeness or you know the relative spatial depiction in this tree means that their structure is more similar between this family than with other families. So this is ATP that is bound to JAK3 by crystallography. Again, I highly recommend you look at the references that I have placed in here. So first thing is that's where you have the nucleic acid, the adenine of ATP is the one that binds the hinge region of the enzyme. So the enzyme is depicted in the, in the blue loops. That's the ATP accepting site of the Janus kinase 3. And that's how ATP enters this accepting site of ATP or ATP binding site through heads in with the adenine binding the hinge region. You have the ribose, which basically is the way that the adenine can present then the ATP. Those are the three phosphates. And of course, you can see, I hope that you can see clearly that the last one is very readily available to be detached by the action of the Janus kinase. And then it actually lights up, produces the energy for the different chemical reactions that are needed. This is tofacidinib in the same Janus kinase accepting site. So the ATP binding site of Janus kinase 3 now will be bound in the hinge region by the uh, pyrolopyrimidine piece of tofacidinib. It doesn't have an adenine, it's a pyrolopyrimidine. Of course, it doesn't have a ribose but the piperidin series provides the linkage so that it can sit in the binding site and there's no phosphorus. There is absolutely no source of energy. So while the JAK3 is fooled by having tofacidinib sitting in the ATP binding site, Janus kinase 3 cannot produce the energy to actually provide the different chemical reactions dependent of JAK3. This is reversible. So after the half-life of tofacidinib, which is about three and a half hours, tofacidinib goes out and it's metabolized by the body and JAK3 enzyme is completely free to accept ATPs and produce the necessary reactions. So it is a, com a reversible competitive inhibitor because of the structure that it has. This is an overlay. Looking now at the two of them, you can see why the pyrolopyrimidine was a very important finding on which molecule uh, they should use to produce the tofacidinib so that it can sit in the hinge. And then it, the overlay, of course, is showing that there's no ATP, but it does not destroy the enzyme. Uh, it is a reversible competitive inhibitor. Now, going back to the family of three, more than 500 kinase use ATP. So what happens if we actually are blocking ATP from working? And if these enzymes are necessary for life, what is happening when we are using an inhibitor that's an analog or, or a competitive inhibitor of ATP? And how can tofacidinib be so selective for the Janus kinase family? Well, what I'm being explained is this methyl pocket. And again, I highly recommend all of these references that walk you through all of the steps. But the methyl pocket in the Janus kinase accepts a methyl from tofacidinib that is not present in ATP. 
And apparently in the Janus kinase family, which I showed you are very close in the family tree, they do have a receiving end or a receiving pocket or ATP that is relatively close to the surface. So this methyl just sort of engages the methyl pocket and does not allow tofacinib to go further deeper inside the enzyme. ATP could go farther inside, inside the enzyme, and that's how it works with the other kinases, because they have a deeper pocket. But tofacinib cannot inhibit other ATP binding sites of other enzymes, because this methyl is actually just blocking it from going further inside. So this is a, a simpler explanation of the complexity of how to create a selective inhibitor of the Janus kinases. I highly recommend these references and I hope you enjoyed this video, that it was educational and please uh, share my other videos in YouTube, subscribe and like if you enjoyed this explanation. Thank you.